Well, thank you very much, Pastor John and the team as well, for uh, certainly making us feel welcome here this morning. I did come from a rainy sunshine coast into pure sunshine here, so I knew the Holy Spirit was here, which was really uh, wonderful. But when I walked in, it was just a, a real blessing to be here, and thank you very much for those who chatted to me and so on. And uh, no, it's great to be here. So, uh, but before I start, let's just start in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we ask for your presence here amongst us, Lord, as brothers and sisters in Christ. We ask you to help me to share your words, Lord, as you wish them to be shared, and hearts to be open, including mine, Lord, to learn and to, uh, to listen and to learn and to grow in those words as well, Lord. So thank you for this opportunity in bringing us together, Lord. We place this day in your hands, always through Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I brought my phone up this time and to set my timer because I'm an ex-academic and as such, one lecture could mean three hours, four hours, but uh, I've just noticed something totally wrong with my... I, I put 50 minutes and it's appeared as one hour, 50 minutes, and I've got to <laughs> change that back. Start. There we go. Start. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I'm not an IT person, but... Uh, um, so... This morning, I, it's, not, it's not just a CMI message I'm sharing. It's not just the message of the importance of the book of Genesis and how, one, how science connects with the book of Genesis. Just gone off, coming back on again. Excellent. And uh, I'm also going to share with you a personal journey. Because that personal journey is a, uh, some, to some people is an interesting one. To me it was a standard one. But to many others it's a rather interesting one. And so I thought I'd share that in how that, uh, uh, well, how that second song we sang, how the God always, our God always loves us and is always patient with us. And I tell you what, with me, he was extremely patient and extremely waiting. And uh, I'm going to have a good talk to Paul when I get there the other side and say, you thought you were difficult, mate. <laughs> Let me tell you my story. So uh, I'll, I'll embed that story into the creation message. Um, and particularly from a scientific point of view. But I'm not going to be difficult with science. I'm not going to give you some really hard words. I'm going to keep it at a very simple level because that's the way I enjoy speaking and uh, uh, really enjoy sharing it. So let's first of all start off with, you can see a few qualifications there. Uh, PhD at University of New England. I'm still a professor at uh, Turon Iliopisto, which is Turku University in Finland. And I've been all around the world and all the rest of it held professorships in numerous countries, and so on. But what am I? Well, I'm classified as a... Uh, turn this on, you can tell I'm not IT-ish. People consider me to be a scientist, <laughs> and that's not a picture of me now, it's a picture of me in the future. How can you tell? Because he's Arctic blonde, I'm koala grey. I'm not quite there yet. I actually do like the term koala grey. I think it's far more relevant to us in Australia than an Arctic blonde. Um, but I'm not really a scientist like that. I didn't really get involved in laboratories. I, work, I did work in them at times, yes, uh, and did experiments and so on. Uh, but a bit of background before I get into the, some of the uh, um, uh, science that actually helped me to come to Christ, actually, is that I was studying landscapes, floods. I was looking at earth sciences overall, sediments, fossils, even microbes. And uh, all of that from a sort of a planetary point of view. I guess if you want to summarise that in simple, I was a flood chaser. <laughs> now, you've seen movies about typhoon chasers, haven't you? Oh, so weak. They, they rush out there, put some equipment in the field and run away. And the typhoon sucks it up and it measures all... You can't do that with a flood. I had to go down there, I had to get in it, I had to measure it. Did I get washed away? Yes. Knocked unconscious? Yes. Rescued by SES in various locations? Yes. Rushed to hospital? Yes. I loved it. It was exciting to do all of that. But why did I go into that area of study? What was my background that uh, I was raised as a non-Christian and so on? A bit of personal journey here. Uh, I was raised in a non-Christian home, quite a violent home. Both parents were alcoholic. And so, uh, I, and, and so was the extended family, uh, aunties and uncles and so on. And uh, so there was a lot of violence when I was young. I still carried the scars on me. And uh, so it was quite difficult. So my maturation, if you like, my communication, all of it was very, very slow. But I thought education could be my option here to, to escape all of this suffering. And uh, so I wanted to go to university. 
They wouldn't let me in at first because my grades were so low, but I actually went to the local university anyway and lined up in every queue, and they kept saying no, no, no. And as I left campus disillusioned, they said, uh, what, uh, this chap came up and said, what, what's wrong? What's going on? I said, I have to go to university. I have to. And uh, I told him the complete story. And he said, how come your grades at high school were so low? And this is, I won't share this in great detail, I became the victim of another form of abuse by a male teacher. And that went on for a number of years. So by the time I got to 18, I was totally dysfunctional, didn't know what to do, but I thought the university would be an escape model. Well, he rang me that night and said, I, I didn't tell you who I am. I'm the chaplain of the university. And guess what? I'm letting you into the university. And, uh, but unfortunately, you're the only student who will pay fees. Everyone else goes free. You don't. So I had to go and work in the steelworks and uh, do all these extra shifts and get the money to pay for that because I'd left home, by the way. I wasn't staying there anymore. And did I pass the first few courses? Of course not. I didn't know how to study. Uh, so I learnt then straight away, don't spend your time with 18-year-olds at the pub drinking. Spend your time with the elderly students. You know the ones that are 21 years of age? <laughs> From an 18-year-old, they are your peer. And so I mixed with the 21-year-olds, and they were happy to mix with me, and my grades went up, and I quickly went through and got an honours degree as well. And then I wanted to do a master's, but they said, no, you're going straight on to do a PhD. You're driven for some reason. Well, I was driven because I wanted to be away from that environment. How dysfunctional was I? Well, at the age of somewhere between 16 and 18, a boy down the street invited me down to come down and spend some time with him, so I did. And uh, that night, his father came home and his mother had a little tear in her eye. And he said, what's wrong, dear? And he, she said, oh, look, it didn't quite go well today. This happened and this happened. And he went, oh, that's terrible. He put his arms around her, hugged her and kissed her. I nearly fell off my seat. I have never seen that in all of those years where this relationship was based on love. Okay, so that, that's where I came from. How did I see my aunties and uncles? Well, I had to go to other places, you know, where people are dressed up fancy and you need to get access and be allowed to talk to them through a window. <laughs> so that's the sort of environment I came from. And so once I had my PhD, which I did in flood chasing, um, and thoroughly enjoyed it, I decided to chase floods all around the world. So I took off. Mainly, a, a part of it, by the way, is because I didn't trust this country. There was no, no, no police work in those days that could help you. They'd come around occasionally, but they couldn't do anything. And uh, so I took off overseas. I spent 10 years in China, absolutely uh, loving it there, working at Chung Mandaiho. Now, I did not go there as an expatriate. I did not go there on the high salaries. I went there deliberately as a local. Why? I was trying to find out who am I? How can I grow? Which culture do I belong in? And so I was there for 10 years, loved it. I spent a couple of years in Finland working at Turon Iliopisto, uh, a uh, university over there, learned to speak Finnish, loved it. I loved being in Finland, by the way, because over there, um, let's just say the men are very quiet. So I didn't have to communicate when I didn't know how to communicate. And it was all came to a joke one day when I was sitting in a sauna with a pastor and he said, now I'll, I'll, I'll try and imitate them. They roll their R's, so my name is Ron. And almost a Slavic type of, yeah, Russian type of speaking. He said, Ron, you are a good Finnish man. And I said, I'm a good Finnish man. Why am I a good Finnish man? He said, because Ron, we have sat here for one hour and you have said nothing. <laughs> And all of this was helping to define me. So ladies, if you do go to Finland and a Finnish man says to you, I love you, understand this, that's the only time you'll ever hear it in your life. <laughs> CNN report has been done on that. And the CNN reporters asked this, these Finnish men, but what happens when you don't love them? Well, if I don't love her, I will tell her I don't love her, okay? <laughs> so the one thing you'll do when you, if you marry a Finnish man is you'll know exactly where you stand. <laughs> but I love being there. I took off to Libya, worked for the Gaddafi government. Oh, that's got you all looking at me, hasn't it? <laughs> I would do whatever it took. Now, I was not working for Gaddafi under terrorism, okay? I was working with one of Gaddafi's sons, looking at water supply, those sorts of issues. And uh, that was all good fun. I found Libya rather interesting. It was not a Muslimic state, and that's what it was all about. That's our media here presenting it that way. There were Christian churches. There were Jewish synagogues in Tripoli. 
Isn't that fascinating? And it was not about the, the Muslim protest that Gaddafi was on about. He was on about Africa. He wanted Africa recognized. He did it the wrong way. He paid the price. But I did enjoy being in Libya. I was treated as an absolute guest. Had a wonderful time speaking of deep Jewish issues, for example, in a Roman sauna in Libya. And it was just an amazing experience to go through all these uh, things. Peru, I love that. I went, anybody here been to the Amazon? You have? Did you enjoy swimming in it? <laughs> Why not? Sorry? Oh, it was in flood. Well, that's a good reason not to... <laughs> I've done that many times and been washed away. You think piranhas? That's Jacques Cousteau telling you a big story. I was up in the Hualaga River. They put up uh, surf life-saving flags. And surf lifesavers, you can go swimming in there. Put your hand underwater if you like. You'll see the piranha. They don't care. You are tasteless. You're too tough. That's a myth. Now, they have found a piranha in Africa that does like to eat people. But in the Amazon, they don't. That's a story by a scientist wanting more money, so they create a mythical image about a particular species. So the next time somebody threatens to put your hand into a Amazonian piranha's dish, you know, that's not going to happen. He's just going to swim around you and go, would you get that hand out of here, please? So they don't actually do that. And so it was really interesting to go swimming there. The one thing you don't do, though, is you've got to be very careful in the Hualaga and the Amazon. It's not the big things that will get you, it's the little things. And they will go into any opening on your body. And I mean any opening. So be very careful of that. And because uh, a friend of mine had something enter an opening that he didn't want it entering. And uh, boy, he was in agony, I can tell you. Uh, a number of them got leprosy. We were shot at over there, by the way. So in all these countries, as I travel through the Pacific Islands, South Africa, all the rest of these countries, Russia, all the rest, was I shot at? Yes. Was I arrested by foreign governments? Yes. Was I gassed and robbed? Yes. I loved it. <laughs> Because I felt, you know, this was somehow making me a person, a man. And why was I then doing all this consultancy work with um, OECD and uh, foreign aid agencies? Because I felt I needed money as my protection. And so I became quite wealthy. Quite wealthy. In doing all of that, the Gaddafi government paid me an awful lot of money. An incredible amount of money, because in those days people wouldn't go there and work. Uh, but it was, as I said, it was environmental work. And that's what it was. So I love travelling the world. It helped me grow up and I eventually came back to Australia once I felt I was uh, able to come back to Australia and sort of had defined myself. I hoped I had done that. But as I travelled the world, of course, I was not interested in Christianity. I was not interested in churches. Why? Because sediments and landscapes and fossils all pointed as I was taught to evolution 50 years ago. That's what I was taught. And so that's what you believe. You're not actually out there doing all the research yourself. and You're doing little pieces, but you're overwhelmed with this concept. Now, I knew that some of it might point to the biblical references and so on, but your teaching and your research was founded uh, basically on the evolutionary model of, of a belief system. And that's what I was doing. And, uh, but one of the things that fascinated me as I was doing this, and that's why I thank my supervisors for my honours and my PhD, they taught me never accept the paradigm. Never accept the belief that you have in front of you. Look at the data that sits outside of the general trends. Don't try and find the general trends all the time. Look outside that. Look at the, why is that piece of data up there? Research that and you'll get some new insights. And so what I discovered was that we think science is experimental. We think that if we're given glassware and chemicals and timing and all the rest, and, and this would happen. If I gave it to one of you gentlemen and said, follow exactly what I've done in this chemistry experiment, and you did exactly that, what answer would you get? Would you get the same as mine? Yes, you would. Exactly. If you didn't, one of us did something wrong. But that's not the way most science is dealt with. It's certainly not the science I was involved in. Because whether you're talking about most of biology, geology, geomorphology, astrophysics, you cannot run an experiment. You, you were not there when it happened. You cannot duplicate it or replicate it in an experiment. You can't do that. And so what do you use? How do you connect pieces of data that you collect? You link them by using your mind. And so on one hand, we're told science is experimental, but on the other hand, we know that it's actually interpretive, it's historical, it's forensic. We don't know that it's actually true. I'm going to put you to the test because I'm an academic. 
And this is the moment you're all worried. You're looking down. Well, if you look down and I can't see your eyes, I'm going to ask you a question specifically to you. So you're all looking at me right now. I'm going to send you to South Africa. I'm going to give you half a million dollars. I'm going to ask you to find a, uh, uh, some dinosaur bones. You're, you're going to put, I'm going to make you a paleontologist. How's that? That's a nice name. And you're going to come back and you're going to tell me you found a piece of dinosaur bone over there. Certain shape, size, dimension, colour, viscosity, whatever. Actually, viscosity is the wrong word, but it doesn't matter. Don't even bother. I like being scientific. Over there, you found another piece of bone, density, colour, all the rest, shape. Now, you come back to Australia then to me, and I'm your, let's say I gave you that research money. I want you to tell me now, raise your hand, if you're going to tell me that those two pieces of bone came from the same dinosaur, the one dinosaur. Put your hand up. Well done. Well done. Congratulations. In fact, Pastor John, you and I are going to write a joint paper together because I gave you the money and you went and found that out. I'm going to try and get you some more money and, you know, we, we might go back together this time, you know, and I, I think I'll look after your promotion as well. Caribbean, Caribbean, we can do that, mate. Absolutely. Wonderful outcome. Now, raise your hands if you'd come back to me and say, no, they do not belong to the same dinosaur. Raise your hands. Oh, a few of you have done that. Congratulations. Well done. Excellent outcome. As an academic, we're going to write a paper together that it's not the same thing. Because you've come back and told me that. We're going to get some research money. In fact, a few more of you put your hand up that time than the previous time. So I think there's enough of us to form a research centre and attract <laughs> more monies. And we'll go back as a team and we'll discover great things. Okay? You happy with that? And I will look after your promotion, by the way, as long as my name's on the paper. <laughs> Here's the question you may not have want, didn't expect to hear. Put your hand up if you did not, if you have not yet put your hand up. Come on, come on, put them up. Okay, I'm not going to ask you to look around. Do you think I gave you half a million dollars to go to South Africa and come back and stand in front of me and go, I don't know. It is not acceptable academic research. It is not. In other words, you're out. Unless you interpret, even though your data are scattered, occasional, maybe spatially separate, whatever it is, you will come up with an interpretation and you will publish that. You see what I'm saying? Is it the truth? Was the first one the truth? Who knows? We were not there. And we can't duplicate or replicate, we can't do anything. Was the second one the truth? We don't know. Does it matter? Well, probably it should, but in today's academic world where you have to publish to be promoted, it probably doesn't matter. You will do it. So, I was taught that before I went out there. So what I'm going to show you is a whole set of slides in, just fun slides as I travel the world and all these sorts of things and others I've downloaded, just to highlight what I saw was a pattern going on around the world that did not match the pattern that all belonged to evolution. There's something else I was seeing, some other feature I was seeing as I travel the world, all around the world. First up, 70% of the planet is covered in sedimentary rocks. That's the sediments that have been washed off the landscape and then laid down out there. Sedimentary rocks. That's 70% of the planet, of the continental? Are you kidding me? That is incredibly wrong from a long-term process point of view. 40% of the planet is actually a flat plateau. Now, you're going to look at that plateau and tell me, yes, you'll accept that that's 300 million years old? Flat? Yes, it's got some steep gorges, but the rest of it is flat. 60% of Africa is flat on a plateau and yet it still stands there after hundreds of millions of years it is not dissected eroded torn apart it still stands there lovely flat surfaces and you see all these lovely layers but you come here to to the Australian continent and there's Wollamombe Falls in New South Wales you can see the lovely plateau on the top there that's all good but what you may not notice is that the rocks underneath are not all flat guess which way the rocks are tilted they're up like this now, each of those rock strata are different rocks. So they have different weathering, different resistance, different patterns to resist erosion. Yet, guess what? They're all forming a plateau. How does that happen? Because simply, rainfall and surface runoff should have eroded some of those more than others and creating an undulating landscape, and it has not. 
it's created as a plateau. I kept seeing this. One year I was flying across China for an hour. I was just flying across a plateau, perfectly flat. I thought, wow, how come? So I didn't have an answer, but I saw patterns around the world like this. When you look at those rocks then, the sedimentary rocks that are covering the planet, you can see these lovely vertical, sorry, horizontal strata. I've indicated them there. They're all going through there. Now the fascinating thing is that scientists love to say they are each representing some minor event that maybe a flood or something that laid down another little layer of sediment and so on. And there might have been years before another little layer came and that's why we've got hundreds of millions of years. There's one big problem. Between those layers there's no evidence of any connection through vegetation growth or erosion whatsoever. It's called bioturbation. Don't even try to imagine what that word means. The point is there's no evidence that that sat there for even a couple of months before another layer was, not, was put on it. In other words, it did not occur over hundreds of millions of years. We know that uh, quite convincingly now. Moreover, you see this sort of feature here. Here's a, here's a landscape being torn apart. It, it is eroding. It's being, you know, landslides and gullies and rills, all sorts of things. But guess what? Underneath we still see these lovely layers. Now, as I said, sometimes they're tilted up, but they're still all lovely layers going together. So sometimes they're curved. The point is they're all originally lovely layers placed one on top of each other. So here's the question I began to ask as I travelled the world. Don't even try to read that, just focus on what I point to. On the top there is the pink layer or whatever it is. It's an undulating landscape, okay? So where we have an undulating landscape, and you see it there, some hills, some river valleys, all sorts of things. But underneath that we have all the layers doing this. Now here's my question that I began to ask as I travelled the world. If wherever I find hills and local terrains like this, as I live on the Sunshine Coast, you see, you know, Budrum Hill and all the rest, you see all these, but underneath it's all lovely like this, shouldn't you find previous landscapes before the sediment came down and sat on top of it? You should find that. And guess what? We don't. As we travel the world, we don't see that. Something is missing here. Because if the sediments are coming down all the time, over hundreds of meters, they should be covering other landscapes. But they're not. So whatever was there before has been wiped out, destroyed. Or, or other ideas, other theories. You see incredible canyons on these plateaus. You can see the plateau crossing the top there. We call them mega rivers or mega valleys actually is what they are. Today, we know that that river could not have carved that valley. When you measure the discharge, and by the way, we have 10,000 plus gauging stations around the world measuring sediment and water, we know that that river could not have carved that valley. Even Charles Darwin, would you believe, standing in the same spot, looking at the same image, said the same thing. No river could ever have done that. Now, he couldn't grasp the, 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 you know, the biblical point there. But he actually said no river could do that. And that's what you see. So that looks like something massive flowed through there at one stage. So what I'm trying to do is create for you now. You have plateaus around the world. They have nice steep slopes on the sides in some cases. But then they're dissected by these massive gorges. As you see there in Molomomba and all the rest. It's sort of, you get a picture of landscapes rising and there being water on the top and as the water runs off it doesn't run off smoothly, it never does. It concentrates and starts gorging out parts of the plateau. You then come across these water gaps and we have them all across Australia. But as I search the world, the, these used to be unique. Water gap is when a river cuts through a mountain as though it doesn't exist. It shows contempt for that mountain. That's only one little example on the Fink River. The Fink River has many more than that, and I'll show you. So it just cuts through. Now, this might seem a strange image. It's a Landsat image. What you see there is the Fink River, the yellow, so the white line coming down, doing lovely meanders as it comes down. There's Ellery Creek coming down and joining it as well. So it's just to the west of Alice Springs. Now, you'll notice there the mountain ranges, if you can see those. They're all folded and tilted. So the river, rather fascinatingly, cuts through ridges that slope this way, ridges that slope that way, some that are doing that, it shows absolute contempt of, now you know the rainfall and how poor the runoff is, how is it possible that that river could flow in perfect meandering systems 
through a mountain range when you think it would have been diverted. As the land rose, you would think it rose. And so a PhD done recently said that all theories of water gaps around the world are incorrect and we don't know the answer. Fascinating. That's new research. You'll find them in Iran, Russia. You'll see them everywhere around the world. Um, fascinating. So again, something didn't match the pattern that I had been taught. And the final one, of course, is really fascinating. These are boulder fields. That's a lovely boulder there. It's a cobble or bubble, whatever you want to call it. There's a, a film cap there. Now have a look at that particular rock. That rock does not belong there on top of that plateau. And so you might say, oh, well, that's, you know, someone's put it there. Well, they've done a lot of work because on that plateau in northwest Wyoming, there are one billion of those perfectly rounded rocks sitting on top of the plateau. You know what that rock looks like to a person who studied floods? It looks like the gravel in a stream bed. It looks like the gravel, the, the sort of the boulders in a, in a stream bed. Why? Because it's rounded, it's concussion marks on it, all those sorts of things. And so you go, okay, that's unusual. People tried to come up with ideas, but guess what? You find another billion of them on a South African plateau. How do you get that? It just doesn't match. So I came to the conclusion as a non-Christian that there must have been a global flood because everything I saw pointed to a global flood. Does it make sense? And so I was like, oh, okay. Now I did, by the way, just to uh, fill you in, I did go to churches as I was travelling the world. And you might ask why. Well, because, why is a good question. We'll write a paper on that and we'll get, I'll give you a, a grant. And uh, so what happened was, uh, where, where, I lost my track with the one. <laughs> Thank you, I love that participation from an audience. What was my question? <laughs> what was my, yeah. <laughs> now where was I? So I'm, I'm, oh, that's right, why did I go to churches? That's the question that Pastor John is waiting for the answer. Because if my professor at the university as I travelled the world or the team leader of a research team or a consultancy team was a Christian, I went along. Why? To get more information about the, their religions. To get more information about, about... What they believe in around the area. Good answer, but incorrect in my case. You are absolutely right though. Many people do. We, you see non-Christians follow Christians all the time looking for that. That, is, that, that we, I can mention later is brilliant. I went because I wanted to be promoted. <laughs> Christians all around the world tolerated me in their churches. Fascinatingly, when I did become a Christian, I rang them all up. I said, guess what? I'm going to tell you the truth. I've just become a Christian. They said, really? I said, what do you mean, really? You thought I was a Christian at that church? No, Ron, we knew all along you were not a Christian. <laughs> but we've been praying for you ever since. <laughs> so I did all that. And how did I get out of the sermon? I actually volunteered in anything I could. Isn't that terrible? But that's what people will do sometimes. We're, churches are at times, we will have people in there who are not Christian. They might be using those sort of techniques or they might be trying to, as this young gentleman said, trying to understand. And in the end, that is exactly what I was starting to do in the end. I volunteered to go to a church in the Cook Islands because I wanted to see what the Cook Islanders did that was different to the other Christians around the world. And so I was interested, ladder in life. So. That's where that connects in. But in that Cook Island church, was I comfortable? No. Because I was going there for my own self. And what happened was the music was beautiful, just like it was here. But there it's deep and resonating, just spectacular music. And this huge Cook Islander gentleman behind me reached forward, put his hands on my shoulders, started to massage my shoulders and say, hey, bro, chill, bro. Hey, just chill. Hey, just chill. <laughs> And I turned, ready to deck him, and then I had to look up. I went, That's not going to work. He detected that I was not a Christian. They invited me to, to lunch. Wow, that was an eye-opener for me. You know, Christians really do care. And so all of that was all planting a seed for me, which was to come later. So second part, just to wrap this, one, this part up rather quick, I did look at sediments and fossils. And you'll love this little bit on fossils that I'm talking about. Because as I travel the world as a dysfunctional person, I travel with other dysfunctional people as well. They're called biologists. <laughs> because they have an imagination that just stunned me. They could write any science fiction, I reckon. 
it was just brilliant working with these people. But I loved them, and my wife's a biologist, that's, and she's not here, so I can say that today, or otherwise I'm walking home to the Sunshine Coast this afternoon. <laughs> How are fossils created? Simple. Most fossils are marine, which is interesting. They're mainly marine, so they're fishless, little fish. Little fish is happy, swimming in some nice clean water, but then the fish panics because he sees sediment, and that's the one scientific word I have. It's dirt. That's all it is. Dirt on the move is called sediment. So sediment washes in there, and you hear about that in the media all the time. We're destroying the barrier reef. We're doing this, and you know, yeah, yeah, I right, dream on. Uh, sediment's going in, and that's going to bury that fish. So now he's most unhappy because he's dead. He's got his <laughs> tongue hanging out. He's just very unhappy with all of that. But when he becomes a fossil, he will be happy. He'll smile because he now knows he's going to get a new name. And if I find him, it's going to be called Ronicus nelicoritis. <laughs> and I'm going to be a paleontologist, and I'm going to use my interpretation. Since I was not there when that fish was fossilised, I'm going to use my interpretation. I don't think they're fins. I think they're the first of the claws that they use to climb out on the land. <laughs> and that's the first fish that made it into animal... Anyhow, those sort of papers I read all the time, I just roar laughing with the interpretation that is placed on those things. What's the key there? The key is sediment. Now that's, what, that's what attracted my interest to the biologist. It was the sediment. And I began to ask the question, where does the sediment come from? Because what you need is a large amount of sediment and it's got to come quickly. Because if it's not covered quickly, what would the fish do if it died in the water? It'll float. It'll bloat and float. It won't be covered in sediment. So to be covered in sediment, to have so many billions of fish covered in sediment and perfect replicas, you can still see the scales and everything else on them, it is amazing, then they were buried deep and fast. So the question I began asking all of my friends was, where do the sediments come from? Because I was an expert in sediment and floods. Where's the sediment come from? I don't see it. I said, what do you mean you don't see it? Because you see that, don't you? That's a construction site. And look at all that sediment. But when you look at all that sediment, is that true? Or is that your interpretation? Do you know it's a lot of sediment? That's colour, you see. And the second point you've got to ask is, how long does that flow for? Probably only a few minutes. Maybe a bit longer. Where does the sediment go? Does it all pile up on one fish? No, it gets distributed over kilometres. So how thick is it? How thick does it deposit? And so I was part of a study in the Cook Islands where we were looking at sediment coming from the construction sites like that, flowing into uh, Takatuma Lagoon. And now I was rising the ranks now. I was a professor, so I could do any research I liked. I thought swimming with the corals on the Cook Islands would be a good piece of research. I like that. And so we discovered that amount of sediment was having no impact on the corals whatsoever. When you monitor it over time. It looks like it's bad. And that's what the media love. But it actually has no impact. That's why one of the top professors in a university in northern Queensland was terminated because they disagreed with the vice-chancellor and said the sediment is not impacting the Great uh, Barrier Reef. And then that person went to court, got re had the whole thing turned around, and then the university sacked him again. Now it goes back to court again. The university does not want to hear that that does not cause damage because it brings them money. So let's have a look around the world in a quick summary. Oceanic sediment deposits. We have many stations around the world in the oceans themselves measuring the amount of sediment. Now we can't measure it for a thousand years, so we have to interpolate. But the point is we are able to measure it over the last 50 years or so, for example. And what do we find? Our estimates are that all around the world, the amount of sediment deposited over a thousand years is 1 to 50 millimetres. Whoa! Am I excited? 50 millimetres? In a thousand years? Oh, come on. That won't fossilise a cockroach. <laughs> how would I, I fossilise billions of things? And that's only the highest figure. Most of the time you're seeing a millimetre. Is a millimetre going to fossilise you? No. Well, my biological friends, whom I was travelling with, I started to challenge them. They said, well, come closer into shore. Let's look at continental shelves. And there it might rise to, you know, 300 millimetres uh, in a thousand years. But still, you've got to remember the fossilisation is intense and rapid. In other words, it's got to be covered rapidly and fast. So in other words, if you take the 300 mils over a thousand years, you're still talking about 0.3 millimetres per year. 
That is not going to do it. If you come on shore then into floodplains, you know, little floodplains out there and you've got a lovely creek flying past here, we could dig down and we could date it. How do we date it? Well, I didn't use radiometric dating because as a scientist I've walked away from it by then because I know it is riddled with problems and I wouldn't accept it as a, as a non-Christian scientist. Isn't that fascinating? Didn't like all that stuff. So how do I date them? Quite simple. I use cigarette butts and Coca-Cola bottles. Because Coca-Cola bottles change with time. So all you've got to go down and dig it and find, oh yeah, that, that Coca-Cola bottle was made in this period of time, therefore those sediments were deposited then. Roughly. You're not exact, but you're roughly. Cigarette butts, they used to have different cigarette butts many, many years ago that did not degrade. And so you find the lower part of the profile with all these cigarette butts, now you don't find them anymore. So you know that's when those cigarette butts were phased out, that's the date of that layer. How clever is that? We use rubbish. <laughs> I don't want you to feel, though, that you should go out and thrash everything out and just chuck it into rivers, OK? Don't, don't do that. It's uh, being silly there, but you know what I mean? We use that technique. What do we find? Wow. In one study done in Fiji, 3.2 centimetres per year was from one massive flood. But one of the highest figures of flood was 10 centimetres out of a major event that I actually researched. It was fascinating. I found the 10 centimetres and I published, it was my very first article, published in a top international journal saying 10 centimetres. Incredible. Everyone was shocked. They got me, you know, raising the, you know, I was being promoted everything out of this because I found 10, 10 centimetres of sediment. And it was in New South Wales on one little stream on one occasion. Whoopie do, 10 centimetres. Will that stop predators from digging up the dead animal or whatever and eating it? No, of course it won't. But the one thing it has given me in my life's journey is I have been able to say scientifically as I travel the world that the dirtiest state on the planet is New South Wales. <laughs> People then said, you've got to go and look at the tsunamis, Ron. Well, I haven't been to a tsunami, but fellow colleagues have. And what do we find? Woohoo! Ten centimetres. Because you think, a lot of public think, and the media think it's a giant wave. You know, you watch the movies. Um, the point is, it's not a wave until it actually touches the shore. It's an energy wave that comes in. Why do all the boats go rushing out to sea when the tidal wave comes? Because there is no wave. It's an energy wave. It's a vibration and circulation. So it comes in only when it touches the shore, when that circulation, the wave, and it touches, will it start to develop a wave. And how do I, I've actually seen a tsunami. It was so exciting. I was actually, uh, I was in Cook Islands and a New Zealand uh, consulate, I was in a meeting in the New Zealand consulate. She said, she said come on, come on, Ron, we're all going down to the, to the water's edge. I said, what for? Uh, we're going to watch a tsunami. I said, are you crazy? No, no, no. We do it every time. Come on down. We're going down to the water's edge to watch the tsunami. I thought, okay. You seem to know what you're doing. I went down there and then they all cheered. <laughs> it was that big. I went, that's the tsunami. They said, yeah. And then it hit me. Cook Islands has a, it's a coral atoll all around Rorotonga. In other words, there is no gradual decrease in depth. So the wave cannot build itself up. Instead, the energy just hits a rock wall. And all you get is a little, little dribble coming in. And I went, yes, I've seen a tsunami. <laughs> Around the world, then, a couple of studies done. Interesting, just to give you a quick overview. The Canadian government decided to chuck some pigs out in the ocean to see if they'd become fossils. At, they did kill them first, by the way. They didn't uh, chuck them out there and let them drown. <laughs> I'm being scientific here, OK? <laughs> just, just trying to make sure you don't get the wrong images. And what happens, they came back uh, decades later, and guess what? They're not fossilised. They've been cannibalised, if you like, or whatever. Something's happened. Well, not cannibalised, that would be another pig. But anyhow, they've been eaten and scattered bones, but they are not covered in sediment. Therefore, they will not become fossils. So that was a waste of good money of the Canadian government. University of Queensland decided to do a study on how to fossilise a, a, a little baby crocs. So they put a couple of baby crocs, etc., under 20 centimetres of sediment, and guess what happened? It bloated and broke out of 20 centimetres. I've written a paper on that. It's in our magazines, by the way, and uh, that's a, it's a fun, light-hearted paper. I wanted the CMI would not let me be mischievous. I wanted to write that when the, the researchers tried to then put it back in, that one of the PhD students was standing on top of it, you know, holding it down. 
but they wouldn't let me say that. The point is it didn't work. With 20 centimetres of sediment, which is way higher than anything we've seen in all our years of monitoring um, around the planet in any environment. And the last discovery was an amazing one. I've written a paper on this as well um, in our magazine, which is for the public, not for the scientists. Um, they've been putting lizards between two concrete plates time and time again over 20 years to crush them and see if they could actually create a fossil. And guess what? Every time they opened up those two concrete pads after every uh, um, 24 hours, they got liquid. That's all they got. What are you made of? Liquid. Liquid. So, what did they decide to do? What I've been talking about all along, sediment. They decided in the end to put the lizards in pieces of sediment, flood sediments, because that's where they're found, the fossils, they're in flood sediments, put the lizards in flood sediments and then crush that. Incredible weight and pressure and temperature. And guess what? They pulled that off 24 hours later and they had replicated fossil development. Where did the water go? Under intense pressure, it was absorbed into the sediment. Isn't that interesting? So in other words, you need lots of sediment under a lot of pressure. And so that's confused the academic world. Oh, one more last thing, you've probably seen this before. Uh, there has been a discovery of collagen tissues, all those sorts of things in dinosaur bones. I won't go into that. We can talk about that over a, over a sausage sizzle. I came to the conclusion then that the sediment supply rate needed to form fossils does not work. Sorry, doesn't work. Not enough. Never has been enough. So how do you create billions of fossils just in one country alone? Or one sedimentary layer alone? How do we have trillions of fossils? Couldn't explain it. Fossils were not formed millions of years ago because that blood vessel and the tissues that I put up last indicates it's only a few thousand years old. Dinosaurs are meant to be 65 million years old, but the fossils don't indicate that at all now. And they have cut up many dinosaur bones and they keep finding the same pattern. So I came to the conclusion then a global flood did occur. As a non-Christian. Fascinating. So now I became more of a... Um, I was not an atheist anymore. I was an agnostic by now. And all the science, by the way, if you want to look up lots more on lots of other topics, we have a creation site uh, where you can go to. We have over 14,000 articles for you to read, and they're all free. And if you're doing assignments, copy them. We don't care. We're not going to charge you for plagiarism. You can copy them all you like and use them all you like. We have a search engine there, and the site is called creation.com. I'm going to be academic again. What's the site called? Creation.com. No, just creation.com. Excellent answer. Excellent answer. You and I are going to get on well. The rest of the class, however, is in trouble. I asked you the question, what is the site called? Now say it again. I'm seeing the better part here in the front. My purpose there is don't forget it. Say it loud, say it again. Creation.com, it is so simple. You can go to an AU, you can go to USA, but if you go to creation.com, you'll actually be connected in automatically to your local area. So, the point being there is you can find 14,000 articles, all you want to read. And if you want to keep up to date with all of them, this is the, on your seat is an info byte and lots of other access there. There's a QR code on the back. All you do is put, scan your uh, uh, phone on there, etc. About every two weeks, we're going to send you the latest piece of information written for you, not written for me. It's written for you to be able to read. And out of that comes incredible articles that you can then share with other people as part of your journey with other people. So... Here I was now, really confused, because I knew that God said, and behold, I myself am bringing flood waters on the earth, in Genesis 6, 17. I knew it, because I'd been to churches. But I was told that I had to say no such flood occurred, a regional flood occurred in the Black Sea. That's what I had to teach. And I became highly confused with all of this. I felt, no, this is wrong. I was taught, don't accept the paradigm if the evidence points the other way. 
And the evidence did now point the other way. It pointed now all the sediments and landscapes, and I, I studied rates, distributions, volumes, frequencies, and fossils, abundance, sorting, role of sediment, all pointed back to the Bible, to the book of Genesis, not to evolution. So I became confused. I'd come back to Australia, and I proclaimed openly at a university that there must be a God. Boy, does a professor of science get in trouble for saying there must be a God. So, I was challenged. Challenged by academics and researchers and so on. One was a lady who was an absolute atheist. Her family was a total atheist. She was a biologist. In another, well, She was actually working in a, in a similar section. And she challenged me over and over again. Because she'd never seen a tutor say there was God. She'd never seen a lecturer say there was God. Senior lecturer. What is this professor who now runs a research centre? By the way, my research centre was on Fraser Island. Why did I have a research phrase at Centre on Fraser Island? Because I could. <laughs> I was now top of the ranks. Thank you. I'll go do my research where I want to do it. And so, and so she was quite challenged by all of that. And she asked me questions that I could not answer. So I said, go read the book, which is the academic trained answer when you don't have an answer. An academic says, go read the book. What does that mean? It means, well, I don't have an answer. But you go and read the book, you'll find the answer. And that meant the Bible. So guess what she did as an atheist? What do the atheists all do? This is going to shock you. They read the Bible. Dawkins and Hawkins and all the rest of them know that Bible back to front. They read it all the time. Why? Because they want to challenge you. They want to challenge us. So what happened was she did. She started reading the Bible. And she came back with me all these awkward questions. Why did God kill so many people? I went, what? What are you reading? And she said, well, I started at the front. I've gone through Genesis and continued on. I went, no, 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 you know what? I knew enough. You're not meant to read them first. You're meant to go to them things they call the Gospels. She walked away from me going, you, she thought I was Christian, by the way, because I said there was a God. She walked away going, you people are strange. You read from back to front. How weird is that? Anyhow, she eventually said, now I'm back in Australia. Take me to your church. I want to prove God doesn't exist. I'm going, what? Now, by then, it had gone on for too long. I couldn't say that I was not a Christian. I didn't, I didn't actually understand that, what she was doing. She just wanted to prove God. I thought it was a scientific question. But she thought I was a Christian. And so we thought, okay. We went to one church. I, I, I went, let's, let's just say it took months. Every time I saw her walking that way, I walked that way. Okay? <laughs> she was so annoying. What happened? I said, okay, I'll come around and pick you up one day. Drove around to her place, picked her up, took her to a church I thought would be good. I sat outside and I said, I'm not going in. Why not? Because I saw everybody going in and they had all those support things. <laughs> and she said, why aren't we going in? I said, because I'd be in the youth group and I'm not going in the youth group. And she goes, that you just don't want to take me to, your ch to a church. And I said, well, look, there's one down the road. And it was a Pentecostal church. So I drove down there, we walked in and straight away her reaction was, oh. Where's the stained glass windows? What's with the band on the stage? Where's the pews? She goes, I don't know what you've brought me into. You know, it's a rock band up there. Mm. <laughs> Anyhow, neither of us remember what the message was. But in the end, the pastor said, lower your heads, close your eyes, put your hand up if you're giving your life to Christ and all the rest. And guess what? She did. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? Except she didn't pay all the attention to the pastor. She did open her eye looked to the left where I was to see was I happy with her becoming a Christian and guess what she saw my hand was up <laughs> an atheist took an agnostic into a church and both gave their lives to Christ that day without any Christian help of brothers and sisters at all did she annoy me anymore no a year and a half later I married her She sends her love and uh, can't be here today, unfortunately. We have an AGM back at home and so on. But uh, isn't it fascinating how God is patient? He'll do whatever it takes. He, will, he just loves us intensely. Okay, just to wrap it up then, is the book of Genesis important? Absolutely. Go onto our site and have a look for Lita Sanders, L-I-T-A-S-A-N-D-E-R-S. She gives a magnificent collection, well, summary, of how the New Testament refers to the book of Genesis over and over again. It's such an incredible piece of work. When you read the New Testament, I want you to notice a number of things. 
And I'm sure you do it. I'm sure I'm speaking to the converted here. But basically every New Testament author either alludes to or quotes from the book of Genesis. Isn't that incredible? In other words, the New Testament authors assume the book of Genesis is a historical document, not a mythology, a historical document. You'll see that even in the way they present Christ to the world at that time. For example, if you look at Peter, and he's out there speaking mainly to the Jewish population, to a Jew Jewish audience they focused on Jewish history and the Abrahamic and Davidic promises. Have a look at the way they express themselves. But when Paul is roaming through uh, Greece or Rome uh, uh, and those sort of places, what, what did he use? What did those apostles use in those days? The Gentiles, to the Gentiles, they focused heavily on creation. And guess what? That's where many evangelical groups are today. Why? No point talking about Jesus Christ because most people under the age of 35 have never heard that word except in a swear or derogatory comment. So what are we using? What do we have to use? We have to look at creation because everybody wants to know where they came from and what their purpose is. But they have an automatic resistance to Christianity. So we have to work around that. Paul did it because that's, he had no choice. So he used the creation. Oh, that's all good. That now means that I am due to finish. And here's the problem. Oh, it turned itself off. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> did Jesus refer to the book of Genesis? Yes, he did. Divorce. The um, Caesar's image on the, on the... Have a look at those scriptures. They're, they're wonderful. Jesus referred to it in the past in terms of the, uh, uh, the Old Testament, the book of Genesis. He used the book of Genesis in his current ministry. And correct me if I'm wrong, Pastor, but I think it was in Capernaum. He said, if, if the people in Sodom had seen what I have been able to do, the miracles and the sharing, they would not have gone down that track. And so he was now using, again, the book of Genesis to talk about his current ministry. But then ultimately he links the book of Genesis to his return. And, and he compares the days of Noah preluding the flood to the days of his return. In other words, Jesus Christ fully accepted the Old Testament as a historical document. In fact, the, Jesus and the apostles relied heavily on the structure of biblical history as the foundation of their very teaching. Jesus accepted in the book of Genesis is important and correct. A question for you. Do you accept the book of Genesis? Or are you challenged at times by various components? I was challenged... You can be all challenged. It's not a problem. But if you are, remember what your pastor says all the time. Read the Bible constantly in prayer. And when you need help, seek guidance from mentors, elders, leaders, pastors and others. Always do that. Always. I'm going to give you a little bit of homework to take with you as we conclude. Two pieces of scripture here. 2 Corinthians 10.5 Cast down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. I want you to meet up at another time during the week or whatever with another Christian. Just explore that in terms of creation and science. And is, are you understanding that piece of scripture? Another piece of scripture here, Colossians 2.8. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition. Oh, isn't that so good? And the basic principles of this world which is the very argument of evolution, rather than on Christ. Again, share that with each other. Ask yourselves personally a question that we should all ask. Where is science and faith? Is faith here and science here? Or perhaps at times do we think science is here and faith here? Or do we try and merge the two together? I'm not saying, you know, I'm not challenging. I'm just saying we all need to go through that process do we, you know, to understand the importance of the book of Genesis. And so discuss all those together, um, just in small groups, over tea or coffee, whatever you have. And our support materials to wrap it up, they're out the front here. We have an answers book, which is brilliant. It's our number one seller around the world. Over 60 questions that you will be asked as a Christian that you may not necessarily know the answer to. If somebody finds out you're a Christian, they might come up to you and say, so who did Cain marry? <laughs> oh, that's a hard question. You know what the answer is? You buy the book and read it. Okay, that's... <laughs> 
There's a two-pager, it's written for families, high school kids can read this, it is brilliant. And we research it and edit it all the time, basically, to make sure it's up to date with the current questions you will be asked. There's another one there, little booklet, love it. It's um, the Creation Survival Guide, it's how to help. We lose 70% to 80% of all young people going to university will walk away from their faith. They may come back later, but the point is they walk away. How do we stop this? Because universities today try every technique they can. Not necessarily be so openly anti, but they do other subtle techniques. Having worked in them, I've seen them. So in other words, this book helps young people. So if you've got nieces, nephews, someone about to go to uni, you might, and they're Christians, you might want to get them this book. It's four dollars, that's all it is. Our books, by the way, do not make profit. Our policy is to link and feed. What do we want to do? Link to you with these materials so you can feed others. They're designed to be given away. Shared and given away. That's why we keep the price at absolutely the price it takes to, re to, to print them and so on. So don't think that's where our money comes from. It does not. It comes from donations, by the way, from people all around Australia and friends groups who look after us and keep all our costs low. They accommodate us, feed us, everything else. And the last one is the magazine. Although there was one other I was going to mention. Just, I love it. I'm going to check. There it is. I'll come back to this one. The magazine is powerful. It's, our number, it's the number one creation magazine on the planet. It's been around for 40 years. Every one of them is balanced with space, biology, geology, children's section, theology, everything. And we also do special deals at uh, this time here. For example, if you buy it for one year, you get a back issue. If you buy it for three years, you'll get a $15 voucher, which, by the way, would pay for that answer. You get that for free then, for a three year. Now this, this magazine is powerful. This has helped so many people come to Christ. People in prisons get this. It's a link and feed. I buy it to read it myself, but then I give it away. When did I give it away the most? When I lay in hospital with a brain tumour. At the time I joined CMI, I had to be, let's say, restructured by the Lord. I was still filled with arrogance and pride. They said, you won't make it, two weeks. I've been through an operation that stunned the medical community. And as a result of that, you can see a little bit of collapse in the skull there and drooping of the mouth, all sorts of things. But as a result of that, I am now studied by a PhD at the University of Queensland as a miracle recovery. I, I mean, it sounds great, but I'm the researcher. Why am I now the subject? But the point is, it was interesting when the professor and the PhD student said, what happened? I said, the Lord came to me. And she said, I've heard that so many times, but now I'm going to study you and find out the truth. <laughs> Falling back into that model that science is the truth. rather than uh, So anyhow, all of that, but that I gave away at the hospitals. Now I go to the doctors all the time because you've got to be monitored for the rest of your life, etc., etc. So every time I put my hand out to a nurse to be blood taken, it holds a magazine in it. <laughs> have you seen that? No, I haven't. Oh, I've read it. You can have it. Oh, thank you. And if you can't, just put it in a, in, a, in a box somewhere, in a doctor's surgery. Guess who, guess who are looking for Christ, most of all? People sitting in doctor's surgeries. So if you buy this magazine, read it, understand it, next time you go to the doctors, drop it off. You'll see people, I've gone into doctor's surgeries and seen people reading it. This is wonderful. So many give their lives to Christ through this process. And you can give it away as well. So that's brilliant. Come back to your comments. Pastor John, the... Um, Wrap this up. At an event down south, we didn't realise in Creation Ministries how powerful this was for young people. We didn't know. Because it's hard to measure. But what happened was, at an event that my wife went to, which was a major event, training uh, university students and others, one of the speakers at a Christian retreat, to, where all these students had to pay to go to, they had to pay a lot of money and all the rest, he said billions of years. Did the students uh, from 18 to 25 get upset? Yes, they did. And they all demanded that lecturer step off. And he's a Christian. They go, what's happened? They said, we don't accept billions. And then what happened was some top Canberrians asked, well, where do you get the idea? And they said, we, one of them said, I was raised on the Creation magazine. It just sat there. And I had all this other material as well, all these other books. And what happened was, they then said, well, how many of you were raised on that? Over 50% of the class put their hand up. Here's the point, though. 
we don't even touch 5% of the market. Yet that room filled with young Christians who were going through uni, being strong, wanting to be leaders in, in, in Christian work wherever they were going. They want to be, guess what? They firmly believed in the book of Genesis. And how do they do it? From that magazine. That hit us like a brick. We were stunned. So I put this little cartoon up where the father says, see that rainbow? It reminds us God will never again destroy the, flood of, destroy the earth with a flood. But the young boy who was not raised with any CMI material, this is a bit of humour here, says, really? My professor said that Noah's flood was confined to the Middle East. Had he been raised on the Creation magazine, not, you don't give it to them, you don't force them to read it, it just sits there on the table, they all said, and they all read it over the years. They went through high school and university. He says, yes, I do see that, but how come my professors can't see that a global flood did once occur? And that book summarises the 40 years it took the best articles, re-digitised, re-edited. It is spectacularly beautiful. You've got Christmas coming up. This is a magnificent book because it's balanced with all the different topics. And this is absolutely, along with the magazine, the two ways that you can really touch others' hearts. Let's end in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to share my personal journey, Lord, and uh, uh, also, also share the, uh, the scientific journey, Lord. And we just pray that it be touching of hearts, not just today, but for all time, Lord. And uh, we just ask also, Lord, that that sound stop. Because <laughs> you always bless us, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. And... Uh, that you give us an opportunity to really explore this in our hearts and then share it with others. We thank you, Lord, always in Christ's wonderful name. Amen.